story like this. Uh, our story are very similar. So, hello everyone. Besides all this, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you today. And we hope that by sharing our stories, that it will inspire you to keep finding effective ways to help families and their loved ones impacted by mental health issues such as borderline personality disorder. My name is Lynn Curry, and my husband Mike today will share our daughter's story and some of our lessons learned along the way. The day we lost our daughter Sasha to BPD, our lives were transformed forever. Sasha died by suicide on June 17, 2011, and she was just 20. I always say she didn't want to die. She just couldn't live with that excruciating pain. So here's our story. It all started 25 years ago. Sasha was born on March 10, 1991. She was a beautiful baby with a lot of energy to share. Growing up, she was very fond of her little sister, Kayla. One day, Sasha came to us all excited to let us know that her sister, Kayla, had finally peed in the toilet. We were all excited. No more diapers. Yay! The only problem is we were in a plumbing mart store and the toilet wasn't connected to a sewage system. <laughs> Let me tell you, we left in a hurry. As a youngster, Sasha was very at, uh, active and athletic. She did all sorts of sports. She loved swimming. She was very good at it, and, she, and it became very quickly her passion. Her goal was to become a Canadian Olympian. Sasha was also a real social butterfly. She knew many, many people, and she was always giving them huge bear hugs, where her nickname, Sash Bear, came from. Ultimately, Sasha's aim was really to get a scholarship to come to the U.S. to be able to go to the Olympics. Sasha was very successful at school. She had not much time uh, to do outings because swimming was taking a lot of her time, and bullying started at a very young age. Because of that, she became more frequently sad and more easily irritable. For years, Sasha as well was surrounded by death. When she was nine, my cousin Fernel was on her birthday. The following year, we had to spend our time at the hospital the day of her birthday. The following year, she lost her other grandfather. The year after, her dog died uh, because of cancer, and the year after, she lost a very dear friend to a very rare disease. All that had a major impact on her and her swimming. She was winning races, but not improving her time. We tried to cheer her up. We were telling her to be happy. She won, not to be sad. But she felt by telling her to dismiss her emotion of sadness that we did not understand her, that we didn't know anything about her. We just didn't have the skills at that time to communicate effectively with her to help her to go through that difficult time. In the meantime, Sasha was becoming more isolated. Our relationship degraded. From the perfect mom, I felt I became the worst mom. We were yelling at each other constantly. She was very emotional, and I was trying desperately to reason with her. She felt that we didn't get her, that we didn't understand anything about her. This is when she did her first suicide attempt. We seek help. After a few sessions, we were told by mental health professional that it was teenage angst, that there was nothing to do. Who were we to argue with the professional? We were told that we had to just go home and do tough loves. So desperate, ashamed, filled with guilt, we did what we knew best. We gave Sasha short and long-term goals. We encouraged her to go back to her swimming, to do volunteer hours at the hospital, to finish her high school, to apply for a university scholarship. That summer, she did all this, and she got a scholarship at the University of Missouri. We were very proud of her. At the same time, I was always walking on eggshell with Sasha. To escape situation, 
that could trigger mood swing or unpleasant outcomes, we would not invite people at home or go places that she didn't want to go. We were afraid that she was engaging in cutting and binge drinking. I always felt that her suicidal thoughts were always in the background. One day, out of the blue, she told me, oh, it's too bad. When a person dies, the people left behind have to pay for their funerals. I went into a panic mode. I didn't pursue the conversation. I was lacking the skills to be able to ask what she meant by that because I was too afraid to, answer the, to hear the answer and wasn't skillful enough to be able to engage into the conversation. At the university, Sasha was doing a double major in psychology and social studies. The first semester, 4.0 average. We were very proud of her. And at the same time, I was still very, very nervous because of the stigma surrounding mental health. Sasha didn't want to tell her school advisor or her new friends that she had tried to kill herself the year before. I was constantly afraid for her life. So every day, we needed to speak and to text each other. I needed to hear from her that she was okay, that she was safe and sound. And then I had the feeling that she was always walking on a very tight rope, and then that she was fragile and that her life was always at risk. And then came a final storm. Dealing with a back injury, a coach removed her from the swimming team and she plummeted into a deep depression. Unfortunately, her teammates, busy with their sports, weren't there to support her into her struggle. And to top it off, her boyfriend broke up with her. At that moment, she gave us a call and she told her she told us that she was going to the hospital to seek help. We were very proud of her because we knew that her will to live was changing to a will to die. So we desperately seek for treatment option and Sasha decided to go to the US for treatment to help her with ex her excruciating pain that she was living with. Unfortunately, after two months, we were told that she needed another six months of treatment and we could not understand why. It's only after she passed away that we understand that's because she was raped and she was dealing with PTSD. But we didn't know about this because of the privacy. We weren't allowed to hear about that. And unfortunately, we couldn't sustain the cost. So Sasha felt that her support system was once more in crumbles. Her pain was unbearable to sustain. She felt that life was too difficult to bear on her own. And Sasha passed away on June 17. 2011, and she was just 20. The stigma, the judgment, the shame, and the lack of skills and treatment availability played an important role in the outcome of our families. We will never get over the loss of our daughter, but we are learning to get used to it. We are learning to stop fighting our reality to let go of our past and to be able to embrace the new slate that is in front of us, a slate that we haven't chosen, but is now our reality. Thanks to any ABPD Family Connection, we are learning and we learn to radically accept our new reality, to better understand BPD, what BPD is all about, to put ourselves in our other person's shoes, to better understand the different perspective in life, to practice self-care, to regain balance in our lives, to live in the present moment with awareness, to learn to let go, to remove judgment and blame, to be effective in our relationship with others, to embrace validation, to build trust before problem solving, and last but not least, to build a sense of mastery to be able to move forward. Thanks to Family Connection, I have been able to regain balance in my life and have the strength to help others, to create an all-volunteer charitable organization for BPD in Canada, 
an important part of our mission of the Sage Bear Foundation is to help families to understand what their loved one is going through and provide skills to family members to help them regain balance in their own lives. On that note, I would like to ask Mike to give an overview of what our foundation is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, we cannot change the past, but we can change the future. So our journey began, and this is just a map of the foundation's ambitious plan. I guess we focus on two areas. The first area is the health system, and the other area, uh, just as important as the general population. We work on reducing stigma in both. That is the first step, to get buy-in. On the health system front, once we get buy-in, we collaborate to help increase capacity for services and quality of services with evidence-based approach in mind. For the general population, we target schools, workplaces, and families with the focus on building individual resilience while at the same time improving interrelationship dynamics for all. We encourage creation and expansion of peer support services to support those impacted. And here's just a few of uh, the important initiatives that uh, support our mission. The first one is school talks on BPD and emotion dysregulation, uh, which have reached now 8,000 students in the Greater Toronto area. Uh, the other one is um, Mindf Mindfulness Day Awareness event. This year we were privileged, really privileged, to have 13 people, people living with BPD uh, share their story in front of the camera with Dr. Blaise Aguirre providing uh, expert commentary. The YouTube video entitled Having a Life Worth Living has been exceptionally well received by those struggling their families and service providers. Sajpair is also proud to be part, and this is very relevant to what we heard uh, before in this, um, in this conference. Um, we're proud to be part of the University of Toronto Psychiatry Department curriculum through a workshop given to doctors transitioning to full-time psychiatry pra uh, practice. The goal of the presentation is to improve care by sharing our family's perspective and issues on stigma about BPD, and we're uh, happy to report that um, that workshop received the highest ratings of all the, all the, the conferences, all the seminars that they received that summer. Uh, and of course, our biggest event of the year, the Borderland Walk, which was grown steadily every year, has been covered extensively by media in Canada. And this year, Dr. Blaise Aguirre from McLean 3 East will be bringing a team to the walk from Boston. Uh, last but not least is Family Connections, which is growing like wildfire in Canada, and I just want to focus a little bit on that. So uh, the Core Skills Learns Family Connections. Uh, family Connections is a 12-week program where participants learn skills throughout, including a better understanding of their loved one, how to practice mindfulness and self-care, how to see things from their loved one's perspective without necessarily agreeing, and how to be more effective when managing a problem. The feedback and testimonials we're getting from our group is nothing short of transformational. Uh, in terms of the impact, and I quote at the top, the biggest gift is feeling there is hope for the future. We cannot underestimate that. The program was, has a very high retention rate, about 92%, and shows a 37% improvement in ability to cope with family situations compared with before the group. From one location alone, in just over a year, we have run eight groups uh, with a total of almost 120 participants. And that's a lot of participants, but it's not enough. So we needed to expand capacity. And, uh, oops. and basically, we had NABPD come to the rescue and um, ex um, help uh, provide training to Family Connection leaders Last October in Toronto, 71 people in total were trained uh, during that weekend, and early results show five new groups were, have already spun off as a direct result of that training. In addition, we have expanded family connections for the first time in Montreal, in the province of Quebec, and we're planning to expand across Canada by the end of the year. Uh, so finally, our borderline walk. Again, I just want to mention this opportunity for family members, loved ones, service providers, educators, and media to raise awareness about BPD, uh, to get BPD out of, sh out of the shadow and actually be able to expose the, the diamond that is all of these treatments that have been uh, focused on 
such an underfunded disorder, but these treatments are really diamond for everything, uh, for other disorders as well. So thank you all, and we hope that our story inspires you to keep finding effective ways to help families and their loved ones impacted by mental health issues such as BPD. Together as one, anything is possible.